Hello everyone, it's that time once again to loop you in on another Space News update. Lots of stuff to discuss once again, from record obliterating feats at SpaceX's Starbase, to Rocket Lab's first ever North American launch, to the Japanese H-2A, the grand arrival of the Vulcan Centaur, and much, much more. Let's kick things off with Starship updates. What a week it was last week! Things began on Monday with a brief test of the FireX fire suppression system on the orbital launch pad, and then we had a new record! For the first time in history, a fully stacked Starship and Super Heavy were fully loaded with propellant. Look at that! Here we can see Ship 24 proudly stacked atop Booster 7, with both vessels sporting frosting up their entire profiles. Yep, SpaceX have completed one of the last remaining major tests required before they can finally conduct the Starship orbital flight test, the fabled wet dress rehearsal. A wet dress rehearsal is a test that simulates every single stage of a rocket launch right up until the actual point of theoretical ignition. This also included an evacuation of the site and neighbouring Boca Chica village. Furthermore, the rocket is loaded with actual propellant in these shots, not liquid nitrogen. The rocket doesn't actually ignite its engines in such a test, as mentioned, but all ground and control systems are run as if it would. Ultimately, this is a big practice run for all systems, and we've heard nothing to suggest that last Monday's test saw any anomaly, which is a hopeful sign that everything is ready now for the orbital launch. This isn't the only amazing bit of news to follow from this. For one, this confirms that the orbital launch mount can definitely support the weight of a fully fueled full stack. Until now, the heaviest load it's had to bear was a fully fueled booster only, so it's great to see that the pad can take this mass. Of course, an operational Starship launch would be even heavier, since the Starship payload bay would feature, you know, payload, but the recent launch clamp mass tests took this extra mass, and then a bit more, into account, so the launch table is definitely up to scratch. And this wasn't just the heaviest load ever supported by the SpaceX Starship orbital launch mount, this was the heaviest load ever supported by any orbital rocket mount. Finally dethroning the Saturn V, the wet dress rehearsal gave Booster 7 and Ship 24 the crown of world's heaviest rocket in history. I can't wait to see that become the world's heaviest operational rocket in history as the orbital flights start to roll in. I'm sure you're all looking forward to the orbital flight test, and if you want to make sure you see my coverage of this, then make sure you hit subscribe down below and ring that bell to enable notifications. And of course, don't forget to give this video a little like as well to help support what I do here. It really helps me stay above water, and I always do appreciate it. In rather alarming news, Ship 24 was de-stacked from Booster 7 not long after the wet dress rehearsal. Okay, this in itself is not too worrying. After all, we knew a de-stack would be necessary due to the fact that its lifting points are still in place, which of course would need to be removed prior to the orbital launch attempt. However, the ship was not just de-stacked from Booster 7, but was placed onto a transport unit, on-screen footage here courtesy of the amazing cosmic perspective, and then carted off to the Rocket Garden, the place where starships go to die. I guess that kind of explains why Ship 22 was hastily dismantled and removed from the garden recently. However, I don't think this is something to be worried about. At the end of the day, Ship 24 doesn't need any major work doing to it. It has all of its engines installed, payload bay door is all sealed shut, and all other major construction and testing milestones have been passed. So I think, for once, this is a case of a vehicle being placed here for temporary storage, rather than being placed in line for scrapping. Likely to keep it out of harm's way for the upcoming Ship 25 and Booster 7 static fires, the latter of which will be all 33 engines of the booster. Anyway, Stage 1 and 2 aren't the only components to an orbital launch. With Starship, all of the launch infrastructure is called Stage 0 by SpaceX, and Stage 0 continued to receive upgrades over the course of last week, chief among which was the continued adding of shielding to the base of the orbital launch integration tower, as captured here by Starship Gazer. Lab Padre streams captured footage of the drawworks equipment and other vulnerable systems being enclosed with protective shielding, and I imagine cladding work will continue as the orbital flight test date approaches. So far, the tower has been largely naked, with some cladding added near the orbital launch mount, but the official SpaceX Starship animation, and indeed the existing Falcon launch pads, all sport much more significant shielding up the height of the entire structure, which indicates a fairly strong chance that some form of more significant cladding will be installed at some stage, though whether full tower cladding will be required for the initial orbital flight test remains to be seen. 
Lots of additional cladding panels have been transported to the launch site, and there are quite a few additional panels being stored at SpaceX's Macy's test site, so expect to see this story develop over the next week or so. I love this picture by Starbase Surfer. This is a picture of the recently removed nose cone of Ship 22, which has now been completely disassembled in the high bay. Check out the size of those forward flaps compared to these people. It's often super hard to get a real sense of scale for these machines, given that there's very little reference points around them, but these four human scale shots really do paint a picture of just how massive these beasts are. Maybe another point of scale is the noise of the chopsticks moving. Moving these massive metal appendages really does induce some moaning. Boca's brain captured this video featuring the structural groaning. Sheesh, you guys got any room in the budget for some WD-40? <laughs> but yes, what a week for Starship news. Wet dress rehearsal is a massive, massive milestone to reach, and I really want to just directly discuss this SpaceX drone footage here. I've said many times on this show how much I love seeing official drone footage, and of course, this week is no exception. But looking at it here now and seeing for the first time all that frost on a Starship Super Heavy, really, my first thought was how much like a CG render this looks. And I think that's definitely a compliment to the talented 3D artists that we've been so fortunate to have with us during Starship's development. I'm especially reminded of Corey's Starship launch and catch animation when looking at this scene here. Hats off to Corey and of course all the other talented animators. Hopefully it won't be too long before we see activities that remind us of Alex Spann's Starship Orbital launch livestream animation. I do love this one. <laughs> SpaceX live streams are always a great watch, and last Thursday's Starlink mission was no exception. This was SpaceX's latest Starlink mission, Starlink Group 5-2, which saw a Falcon 9 deliver 56 Starlink satellites to Starlink Shell 5 in low Earth orbit. This was the ninth mission for this particular Falcon 9 first stage booster, 1067, which had previously supported two International Space Station crew resupply missions and two crewed missions to the station, the Turksat 5B launch, the Utilsat Hotbird 13G mission, the Empower 1 and 2 mission, and the Starlink 4-24 launch. Quite the variety of customers for this one. Shortly after second stage separation, the booster successfully landed on the drone ship Just Read the Instructions, and so we should hopefully see many more missions to come from this particular Falcon. I'm unfortunately not able to talk about the other Starlink mission we saw last week, as it took place only about an hour or so after this week's installment of Space This Week went live to Patreon and YouTube channel members. Yeah, I just wanted to kind of address this one actually, since a lot of folks get confused about how there are comments on this video that were apparently written before the video was uploaded. If you join my Patreon page or YouTube channel membership, then you get one day early access, which unfortunately means that I don't always get to include the latest launch if one took place on Sunday. But no matter, I'll be sure to cover the Starlink group. 2-6 launch scheduled to take place on Sunday in next week's episode of Space This Week. Or I guess this week's if you're part of the uh, early access gang. <laughs> Luckily, it wasn't just SpaceX carrying the launch calendar last week, we also had Rocket Lab's first ever launch from their launch complex at the Mid-Atlantic Regional Spaceport in the United States. Usually Rocket Lab, of course, launched from the Mahia Peninsula in New Zealand. This launch was dubbed the Virginia is for Launch Lovers, the name there referencing the state the rocket launched from, as in the state in the United States, not like solid liquid gas. <laughs> that was terrible. This launch will pave the way for all future Electron missions from United States soil for government and commercial customers. Last week's mission took place on Tuesday, and the rocket carried three satellites for Hawkeye 360, a radio frequency geospatial analytics company, to low Earth orbit. These satellites will be used for signals intelligence for Hawkeye 360's customers. Last week, we also saw a launch from Japan. On Thursday, we saw the launch of a Mitsubishi Heavy Industries Mark II rocket from the Tanakashima launch complex. On board was a single information gathering satellite on behalf of the Cabinet Intelligence and Research Office, a Japanese intelligence agency, under the Cabinet Secretariat and principal member of the Japanese intelligence community. This particular satellite was the latest in a series of satellites for the Japanese spy satellite program, and given its military-based purpose, little has been disclosed about it. Still, it has been a little while since the last Asian launch that I've been able to talk about. China's space agency has been uncharacteristically quiet these past couple of weeks. I hope the Long March space program hasn't encountered any problems recently. Anyway, looping back to the H2A rocket in question, enjoy these launches while they last. There are only four more planned before the rocket is retired for good, and the H3 rocket replaces the entire H2 rocket family. As of late, I've been including upcoming Artemis mission updates in these space news videos. Usually it's a case of fuel tank segments being welded or joined, which, while definitely significant, aren't huge milestones. However, I definitely think we have a big one. On the 14th of January, technicians at NASA's Kennedy Space Center installed the Orbital Maneuvering System's engine nozzle and its heat shield for Artemis II's European Service Module. 
The Artemis II service module will provide the power necessary to propel the Orion on its trip around the moon, including in-space maneuvering and all the other commodities necessary to sustain crew for the duration of the mission. Yep, although this mission will be essentially identical to Artemis I, which we've already seen, this flight will feature real astronauts, which makes it several orders of magnitude more exciting than its predecessor, which was already my favourite launch of the past year, so hardly small boots to fill. I'm going to go ahead and assume that most people watching this video are all excited for Kerbal Space Program 2. Well, as the big release day nears, the official KSP social media channels have been sharing some great new footage and screenshots, and I really liked this clip here, showing some very Starship-esque cargo bays. I guess the follow-up question I would have is, what's going to launch first? The real Starship Super Heavy, or one built and flown by players in Kerbal Space Program 2? I think this is actually going to be a kind of close race. What do you think? Put your predictions in the comments. Another upcoming launch at some point this quarter is the maiden flight of the Vulcan Centaur. United Launch Alliance have shipped the first ever Vulcan core stage to the Kennedy Space Center, and it's going vertical. I really love the paint job. Vulcan is definitely one of the best looking rockets out there. Almost as good looking as I'm sure the fantastic folk who support me on Patreon and through my channel membership schemes are. Their names are on the left there, and if you want to see your name there as well, then consider joining either squad and get these videos a little bit early as well. But guys, thank you all so much for watching today's episode of Space This Week. I always do appreciate you stopping by. There's two video suggestions on screen that YouTube thinks you'll like that are also from my channels. Hopefully you'll enjoy those too. And that's it. Thank you once again for watching, and I'll see you when I s in the next video, whenever that may be.